Mm -hmm. Great. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's Belfast Garden Club presentation, Winterizing Gardens with Jean Bose. I'm Brenda Harrington, Program Librarian at the Belfast Free Library, and we are once again pleased to host the daytime lecture series with the Belfast Garden Club as we still can't meet safely in the Abbott Room. Thank you all for joining us. Before I turn the mic over to Margaret Campbell from the Belfast Garden Club for updates and to introduce our speaker, I want to remind everyone to keep your mics muted and let you know that the program is being recorded and will be available on the library's YouTube channel and the Garden Club website. Okay, with that, Margaret, take Thank it away. You, Brenda. It's a pleasure to have Jean Vos here today. She will be speaking about winterizing your garden. Jean is a master gardener, certified horticulturist, and former backyard bee, um, beekeeper living in Noble, Nobleboro, where she has created gardens to attract pollinators as well as beneficial in, insects and creatures. So please put your questions in the chat function and Corliss Davis will go through them after the presentation. Jean? Oh, hi, everybody. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Um, I've never really spoken this way, but uh, I'm being coached, and I'm sure I'm going to be just fine. So it looks like winter is upon us, huh? It really got cold, got me to get my fleeces out this morning. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what we want to do to winterize our gardens and our homes and stuff like that. Now, because we live in New England, we all know that we actually have 12 seasons here. We have winter, we have the fool's spring, which we all want to take out our, um, our uh, t-shirts. And then it goes right back to second winter. And then we have a spring of deception where that's when the crocuses come up. And then we have our third winter just to make those crocuses look even prettier. And then the pollening, and that's when everybody's sniffing and sneezing. Then we really get spring and it's warm and it's beautiful. And then that just runs right into summer. And then uh, we have a little bit of Hell's Front Porch like we had this year, only it was um, in June rather than July. And then the false fall, we all kind of like that because it cools right down. Second summer, which we just went through and have been going through up until this past week. I've never seen an extended summer like this. Then we have actual fall, which is I think where we are right now. So fall reminds us to return to our routines that anchor our lives in time. For gardeners like us, this means time to get our gardens and our flies ready for the coming winter and the promised spring. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. So preparing your home for winter, we're gonna start here. And you know what, seeing that white stuff, it's not too far away. Uh, Mount Washington had a bit of snow this week. I wanna talk first about the annual obsolete pesticide collection that we do in this state, just because it's almost coming to an end. It's only through October. So if you have some pesticides left over, DDT, which you shouldn't have at this, this time of our lives, but other things like maybe Roundup stuck way in the back someplace in your shed, now's the time to get rid of them. So there's, um, it's registration required only, no drop-ins are accepted. And at the bottom of the screen, you'll see that website to go ahead. You don't need to scribble it down because we are going to um, save this and put it up on the websites. So one of the things we wanna do now is finish sealing up our home from our fall invaders. And we all have them. You might not ever see them, but sometimes you will, like ladybugs and stink bugs. They're looking now for overwintering shelters in warm places. That's not like our houses, folks, up in the attics and stuff. While they don't really cause any structural damage, if it gets warm, they can become quite a nuisance, especially when they're in large numbers and invade your home. So if you're not willing to share your home with such insects, now should be the time to repair your torn window screens, and you can put patches on them, the ones they sell, that works. Repair the gaps around your windows, doors, and any vents that you might have, especially like the dryer, and the, the vent for your dryer to go outside. Those have openings around them, I found. And seal up any other gaps where they might be able to enter your home. So you might wanna go around with a flashlight and that sort of stuff and look in corners. So some ways to prepare for the winter. That picture you see on the screen is my house in 2016 after a huge snowstorm that absolutely buried the north part of my house. The porch that you see is my front door, front door porch and the wind came right screaming through there. And so the little hanging over envelope thing 
is actually like an envelope. It's sort of about four feet out from my porch roof. So that's winter here in Maine. So we want to attend to our landscaping, check around the foundations, looking for any fractured bricks or any moisture damage like mildew, et cetera. You want to look for um, cracks around too with window and door seals, um, waterproofing them. Look for your roof leaks now before um, winter comes. Finally, before winter comes, you want to get some good curtains and blinds. Um, you want to play, which really help to keep your um, home warm. I'm going to stop for a second and see if I can't change my view. Brenda, what I'm seeing is three people down the side and I can't see my notes. So how do I get rid of those? Um, well, if you, I, I'm not really sure. If you go up to the top of the thumbnails and yeah. put a min and minimize and push the minus button. Okay. Or you can move. There this, it is. Nope, you can I'm move all, the, okay, I'm you're all set. set. I got okay. it. Thank you. Thank yep. you for the coaching. Okay. Yep. So, um, oh, at the end, finally, before winter comes, you want to get some good curtains and blinds, maybe even those darkening ones. Um, they really do play a huge role, keep your house warm and decreasing energy bills, particularly when the wind starts to blow. And we know here in Maine, the wind blows a lot. So here's kind of a quick fall checklist of things you want to do before winter actually comes in. Cleaning and stowing your motor, weed whacker, leaf blower, anything that has gas in it, don't forget to put that fuel stabilizer in. Another hint there, I add fuel stabilizer to my gas, my stored gas also, but all summer. Um, um, mower guy said to me, put it in your gas, put it in your, you know, your mower. It runs better. You want to take your garden hoses off those faucets, drain them good, and then store them. This should be an early fall priority. Um, this week, it's going to get a little bit warmer. This would be a time to do that if you haven't already done it. And I just wrap them up and put them in a great big black plastic bag and shed where it's not freezing. If you have a sprinkler irrigation system, now's the time to open the drain valves to get the water out of the system. You don't want it to freeze there this winter. Degunk the gutters. And I don't mean use a ladder unless you have the ability to use a ladder, which I don't. I'm too old to go up there. But somebody to go up there and take a look and take all those leaves and stuff out. Eyeball your roof and you can do that from the ground with a pair of binoculars. You're looking for loose shingles or anything that doesn't look quite right. You wanna call your roofer. Um, last thing you want is uh, 24 below zero weather in the middle of the winter with a leaking roof and somebody has to go up there because you won't find too many people that'll do it. So check your furnace. You want to have a heating cooling pro. You want to have a pro do this. Mine did it yesterday. Also check my um, hot water tank to be sure that that was clean and ready to go. And if you have a fireplace, you want to give it the once over. That means you want to open up the vent and look up to see if you can see daylight. If you can't see daylight, you need to call the, you need to call the chimney sweep. And it's best to have the flue cleaned every year anyway by a chimney sweep. That way the creosote and stuff that will catch on fire, he, gets, he cleans out. So let's talk a little bit about preparing our gardens for fall. So as the fall weather takes hold, we need to change how we do things in our landscape, getting ready for what's coming. Um, we should start work about six weeks before the first hard freeze. So it means we need to start somewhere in mid-August to um, be thinking ahead, always think ahead in your gardens. Every winter, um, on average, our risk of frost starts in October 6th or so and goes right through May 9th. So right now they're saying October 12th to 13th to May 15th is pretty much uh, what we're gonna see for frost. Almost certainly, however, we know that we're gonna get frost right after October 14th. And they are predicting for this mid of this week, some maybe lower temperatures here, even here on the coast, not frost, but really lower. It's forcing me to take my planted plants that are on my house plants that are outside and bring them in before the weekend because Sunday is supposed to be the when it's going to be cold. So fall cleanup. So are you ready? Falls are coming. Wondering what you should do? Got you covered. Fall is a real busy time of year no matter where we live and we know school opens and all sorts of stuff is going on and we're busy but we got to get out there in our yards. Um, be sure you give your yard and garden the best chance to produce a fall garden, survive the winter and get ready for spring. So the art of fall cleanup. Do it while the garden is still pretty and you can't bear to part with it. It's a nice time to work too. You wanna to work when it's 30. Leaves beginning to fall are one of the first cues. Even nature says, okay, to end it now. Aim to be done before the heaviest leaf fall. Uh, leaves are like the icing of what you've done for your fall work. Look at your hoster. If you have hoster, 
It's one of the first early warning devices. They kind of just melt away after a first frost. They look ugly. So starting before the really heavy frost and freezes um, is good because otherwise the work is much more difficult. And if you don't cut it or take care of it before that 60 degree weekend in glorious October, winter will sneak in when we're least expecting it. This is New England. So fall cleanup of yards and gardens. Um, a good IPM program helps reduce your dependence on insecticides. I am a no insecticide person in my yard. I do companion planting and I do a lot of hand picking up things. So um, I don't have as many bugs as I used to years ago. But right now you wanna think about raking your beds to take out the leaves or broken stems and other sorts of things that have fallen. You can remove hiding places or areas where insects can overwinter and become pests again on trees and shrubs. But that said, when you do that, you also remove the areas where your beneficial insects and pollinators can take winter cover. So if you have a designated pollinator garden, just one that you just grow for pollinators like I do, leave that area a little messy for fall and winter. It allows for the overwintering habitat for those insects. I also don't do my cutbacks now until spring, but I may cut back to about 12 inches now if I have really big tall ones, because down in the root section is where um, the good guys, so to speak, live for the winter. So you want to leave some of that plant material to feed and shelter our, our beneficial birds and animals and um, other insects, um, leave, leaves and plants and seeds, a bare area, lawn, brush piles are always helpful. That's where this little guy leaves, lives is in the brush pile outside my back door. Even small amounts of seeds and brush will help the good guys, so to speak, make it through the cold winter months. They'll thank you, but so will your garden. This little weasel, he likes to go down burrows for um, chipmunks. And if you're a chipmunk lover, cover your ears because he does eat them. But if you have a chipmunk overrun like I did a couple of years ago, I was thrilled to look out of my kitchen window and see him standing in my brush pile one morning. You wanna go out now and assess the damage from the summer or even from some of the early fall storms. Take a walk around your garden. Look at how the plants did over the summer. Uh, a flower garden can tell you a lot at the end of the growing season. And you know, if we have extremes of high temperatures and flooding rain like we did this year, some of your plants may have suffered. So you want to assess the results of what's going on and get ready to prepare for next, next spring. Looking ahead now for next spring. So you might want to jot down what's worked for you and what hasn't worked for you with individual plants. Sometimes what hasn't worked with individual plants is because they're not where they're supposed to be. Maybe they got a little bit too much shade and they really love sun or maybe the vice versa the other way around. Identify which plants have outgrown their space and need to be divided. Sometimes you can do fall dividing right now, and sometimes you wanna wait till spring. You wanna pull up any dying plants and check them for diseases. So you don't want pests and diseases overwintering in your patch of lawn or garden. Burn or bag any diseased plants. Please don't toss them on your compost pile. You'd just be um, asking for trouble in the spring. There's some slimy looking leaves. They got hit by the frost. So any plant that's slimy or matted after a hard frost gets removed. Get them out of your garden. Don't put them in your compost. Um, pests and pesty bugs love slimy plants. Hostas and Solomon seals both get really slimy. Um, make sure you dig out all of your weeds that you can see. And be sure to give your garden enough water right now to keep them moist in the winter. Um, you can tell by when you water or put your finger down. I always put my finger finger down in the soil to see how deep this, you know, where I hit water. If it's beyond my index finger, I water. Stay on top of those weeds, even piglet does it. They not only give pests and diseases an excellent breeding ground, but they also compete with your plants for the nutrients that they need. So pull them as soon as you see them. Because you do allow them to take over your garden, it's real hard to get them back under control. You wanna take dead wood or snags from trees and shrubs and perennials and sometimes that's just cutting back. Sometimes it's taking whole shrubs down, trees down. I took down a 200 year old oak tree this year on my front lawn that was threatening my house. That was interesting, let me tell you. It was 85 feet tall. But I also had to take out some other shrubs and stuff that had died from unknown diseases. So here's some fall lawn care practices. I'm not a huge lawn person, frankly. If it's green, I mow it. But I do follow the one third rule. And I do follow the sharp mower blades. And I do try to leave my grass clippings on the lawn. So to that end, I have a mulching lawnmower. Um, you do have to be careful with that because those can get pretty bound up if you mow too high a too high um, 
high grass, it's too high, you let it go past the one third. Um, three inches all summer, but two and a half right now. You can lawn court aeration if you want to. I've never done it. I've watched people do it. Um, sometimes they walk around with spikes on their shoes, guys with golf shoes, that's a good thing for them to do. Overseeding is not a bad idea though. If you have a patch of lawn that maybe your doggy went there and killed the grass, just rake it up, throw some soil in there and some seeds. And I saw recently a bag of soil with grass seed and fertilizer all in one. I thought, hmm, that's a good idea. Fall fertilization, it's really a good time to do that right now because um, the growing roots, it gives them lots of extra nutrients to get strong and healthy um, and gives them an extra boost in the spring when the temperatures get warmer and the blades of grass start growing right again. Again, like I said, repairing lawn spots and damage, this is the time to do that. And raking leaves. I do and I don't rake leaves. I know that sounds weird. Um, I do allow them to stay around. I do use them to mulch my flower beds. But if you get too many leaves and they mat, they mat down with the, with the wetness, it's not real good for your lawns at that point in time. It suffocates the grass. So um, it's kind of like you have to decide what to do. Okay. I can't read what it says here. I Something came in. Well, that's okay. So um, divide perennials on a cloudy overcast day. Um, dividing on a hot sunny day causes the plants to dry out too much. Right now I'm potting up a lot of plants to take to Rhode Island with me. So I'm being really careful to put lots of extra um, potting soil on top of them once I get them potted up and giving them a good water. Now's not the time to fertilize though. You do not want your plants to be trying to grow now. Water the soil a day in advance if you can see that the soil is dry. Um, again, divide the plants when you know there's a couple of days of showers coming. Not only do you want the new transplants if you put them in the ground to get water, but you want the where you took them from to also um, get enough water. So why should we divide perennials? The age old question. Well, it helps rejuvenate your plant and stimulates new growth. And overcrowded plants like uh, daffodils are famous for this. They compete for nutrients and water and restricted airflow can lead to diseases. So dividing them into smaller sections helps that stimulates no growth. My daffodils didn't really bloom very well this last um, spring. I need to dig those up and spread them out, give some of the bulbs away to friends and neighbors um, and start over again because daffodils particularly, if you, they come up and they don't bloom, they need to be split up and divided. So it helps also when you divide to control the size of the plant. Um, different plants grow at different rates. So division can be used to keep plants that spread rapidly under control. Um, and if you increase the number of plants, it's an easy and inexpensive way to increase them and share them with friends and, and then plant them in your yard. So first, how do you want it? How do you do it? Here's the how to. Dig up the parent plant using a spade or a fork. Gently lift the plant out of the ground. Gently is the option word here. Remove any loose dirt around the roots. I don't go too bare root there, but you don't want a big clump of dirt around them. Every division should have three to five good looking shoots and a healthy supply of roots. Um, okay, here we go. Separate the plant into smaller divisions uh, like this. Either gently pull or tease the roots apart with your hands. Some you can do that with. Cut them with a sharp, sharp knife or a spade like you see in the picture. Or put two forks in the center of the clump back to back and pull the forks apart. I have to do that with hostas. Then keep the division shaded and moist until they're replanted. Okay, so here's the fork method. Put them in back to back, and then you just, you put them in and then you pull them this way. I usually have my friend help me because that's, it's, it's a lot for me um, physically to do. I'm not really able to do that. So um, this is my house. These are my, um, what my window boxes look like at this time of year. Um, only this year I planted uh, purpley ones. They're very pretty. You wanna replace your summer annuals that were in your window boxes with cool weather flowers, like mums and that sort of thing that you see now. Dig up any bulb plants that aren't hardy like dahlias and gladiolas. You wanna plant more perennials now whose deeper root structure lets them seek out moisture and they do better now than in the heat of summer. Mix up your plantings. Look, try a more cottage garden approach, mixing flowers, herbs, and small shrubs. Um, that mixture provides great bi biodiversity, encourages your pollinators and beneficial insects. It makes it easier if you wanna create a ground cover. And so many different sorts of, of plants together uh, does provide some um, resistance against pet, 
against pests attacking you. Don't jump the gun on winter protection. There he is. You don't want to put your protective mulch down too early, like branches or hay or salt marsh. I try to wait until after a couple of hard, heavy frosts. And then um, I may have some mulch down, like some light hay or stuff, but the heavier stuff that we really should be putting down up here, I wait till the really hard frost has gone by and then I put it down. Because by then these little guys, these little mises, have found a place to go. If you put down that cozy layer too early, the mice will move in and they'll have the nicest, snuggest, warmest, cushiest winter. And at the same time, they have plenty to eat with your plants. So put it down when it's cold. The mice have already found another home to go, like your garage or shed, and hopefully not our beehives. So you want to conserve your greenery. Okay, you should use, leave, use leaves to do that. When you rake up all the leaves in your property, make sure to add them to your compost or put them in an area to turn them into leaf mold, which is so good in the spring. Um, it's easy, it's best to chop or shred them first. I use my lawnmower, I just run my lawnmower over them. I, I rake them into like a windrow and then run my um, lawnmower over them because they have good nutrients for your soil. So they're good in the compost and they're good on your garden beds. Okay, this is my garden. Um, taking the effort to clean up the vegetable garden beds in the fall makes it really easy to begin. This is the only garden I tell you to take everything out of, unless you've got some perennials, like asparagus, of course, you're not gonna pull that. But if you have some perennials um, growing, you leave those in, but everything else should be pulled out. All the weeds should be pulled out. Weeds, you may not wanna compost. You may wanna put them in a separate area of your uh, uh, yard or throw them in the trash. I have mixed emotions every year as the gardening season comes to a close. Um, it begins with a preserving marathon when I spend way too much of my time in the kitchen trying to keep up with what I've got coming out of my garden. I'm kind of relieved and a little sad when the garden harvest ends each season, but um, it's well worth it. So quick tips about gardens. This also is that same garden you just saw, only now it's been cleaned out for winter. I use Robin's wood shavings um, as a winter mulch and I use it during the summer too. These are raised beds. I do practice lasagna gardening. <clears throat> so you wanna harvest the last of your crops, use up all your green tomatoes, nothing like fried green tomatoes at this time of year. Pull up, like I said, all your perennial weeds, burn, leave the soil. Um, I level the soil with a metal rake and then I get ready with layers of mulch or leaves, compost, manure, cover crops, whatever I need. I don't always do cover crops, and I do try to get my compost out there before I close up for the winter though, because it works into the soil all winter long. So here's some fall garden ideas, fall decorating garden ideas. Use fall for decorating and enjoying the season. You wanna provide vibrant color as all our other plants are gone. I mean, right now, um, they did the pictures for my house last week. All I have is a little bit of fall flowers left. So I had lots of mums around for color. So a sunny, well-drained location, you want good air circulation. Um, these fall flowers are just beautiful. You wanna water them in, providing some protection from the cooler temperatures. You can place them in beautiful containers, dressing up your doorsteps and patios. You can plant them into size appropriate pots, or you can put their pot into a larger container, which is what I tend to do. Remember though, you wanna keep the soil moist through the hot wet weather of late summer. Right now, I'm really struggling to keep these mums um, wet enough. So here's a couple, some other fall garden plant ideas. Mums, of course, are traditional and beautiful. Annual grasses, I love the penisteum in the bottom left-hand corner here, the purple fountain grass. Salvia on the right is always pretty. Um, Gomfrina, which is the upper left. Ornamental peppers are fine, but remember you can't eat those. Sedum is always in, in fashion in the fall and marigolds are my favorite. So um, continuing with your shrubs, if you planted shrubs this spring or summer, you want to keep on watering, watering. If you planted them this fall, you want to keep on watering them every day, one to two weeks after planting. But after a while, after like about 12 weeks, you can do the water weekly. It takes one to two years for the roots of trees and shrubs to get well established. So adequate, but not excessive watering does help. So you want to water deeply. So see what he's doing with the hose. He's not just leaving the hose there to run into it. He's actually holding it so he can control where it goes. So for young trees, the recommendation is one to one and a half gallons per inch of stem per watering. So that's quite a bit of water actually. For shrubs, the volume of water should be equivalent to about a quarter or a third of the volume of the container that you brought the shrub in. As the roots grow and spread, 
you may want to increase the volume of the water. Morning's the best time to water. Um, you want to do it at the root level. You don't want to do it from above with the sprinkler because the leaves get, leaves get wet and they can actually lose the water through evaporation. So here's um, just a slide to give you a few ideas of some fall plants to give you more bounce to the ounce, so to speak. You want to choose the types that grow well in your area. So watch out for those zones so you know. Um, some plants are better for pollinators than others and bloom into fall. And of course, I'm always looking for pollinator plants. But in my garden, um, I do grow borage and I grow it in my vegetable garden. Asters are my one of my favorite. Uh, oregano, and that's always good. Yarrow is a good one. Um, actually, they're all good. But the one I have in bloom right now is purple cone flowers is still in bloom in Nobleboro in my house. Um, my basil is still blooming at my house too, which is kind of, and of course the asters are as well. And here's another um, short, another list too, um, showing off some long, longer blooming plants for the fall. It's so hard to find a plant that will bloom all the way into fall. Um, it's kind of tough, but that's what we tell everybody you should do. These are marked as native or perennials. Um, so it's kind of interesting to see that because if you want them coming back year after year, you want those perennials. And I'm always telling you, sh you we should um, be looking for natives. I was going to chat a little bit about possible frost. You want to be sure to cover your tender crops cover. What does that mean, Jean? Okay, well, that can mean anything from a sheet to a, a gallon milk jug, for that matter. As the temperatures start to drop down to 32, I start doing this when the temperatures are going to be 34, 35 at night, I watch. Mostly I cover my tomatoes and for those I use a sheet. So when you see a cold snap coming, you need to act fast. Um, the county in 2020 had its first freeze on, um, on Sunday morning, 9-13, essentially ending their growing season. So when the mid coast, this is still mid coast up here, is predicted to have an overnight temperatures consistently in the low 40s, it does mean I'm bringing in my house plants and they're all coming in tomorrow. So what exactly is frost? I kind of thought this picture was pretty, except I think it's a rose. So that means it's not gonna last. So in zone five, our frost dates, like I said, can be October 6th, 15th, right around in there to May 9th to the 15th. We can expect a light frost might arrive anytime after the second week of September. And when I first moved up here, my neighbor said, oh, Labor Day, we always get a frost, get out your sheets. And he was right, but we don't have, that doesn't happen. That was 23 years ago. Climate change has changed that. So a light frost is considered 29 to 32 with tender plants are killed. Tender plants, roses for sure. Basil doesn't care for it either. A moderate frost is 25 to 28. I think that's cold. Uh, widely destructive to most plants and severe 24 or below kills everything. I mean, that's your hard, deep killing frost. So frost effect on plants, this is holly. And um, this is my holly actually. So the light freeze, Tender plants are killed with little destructive effect on other vegetation. The moderate, widely destructive effect with heavy damage to fruit blossoms and tender and semi-hardened plants. This comes into effect sometimes in the spring. My peach tree has beautiful blossoms and then we get a moderate freeze and I sit there the next morning, watch them all go plop, plop, plop on the ground. And the severe freeze takes everything just about. Oh no, frost is coming. What do I do? I don't have anything. Well, you have a lot of options to protect your plants, even if you didn't plan ahead, or maybe if you didn't have anything to cover them with. So for individual plants, a bucket, a flower pot, a plastic bottle, even a cardboard box just for the night. For the sturdier plants, like the tomatoes that have stakes, you can lay a garden fleece, a burlap sack, a blanket, a tarp, or a sheet right on top of them or on top of the garden bed. For the small, little, not so strong plants, you can lay, if you laid a blanket on top of them, you're going to break them. So you can use stakes with blocks um, that provide some support underneath your cover. So you'd stake around them and then lay the cover on top of the stakes. Be aware though that thinner covers like bed sheets might not provide complete protection and tips of plants can still get bitten by the frost even where the cover touches them. So that's just another thing. I only use bed sheets on stakes for tomatoes. I don't use them for anything else. But no matter what you use, you absolutely must remember pull that cover off in the morning, or you might smother or burn those plants. So here's some cover up ideas, just to give you an idea of the sorts of things that people use to cover up. The top right one is a soda bottle, I think, or some sort of a bottle. The bottom right is what I was talking about, those um, tender plants that, you know, will get smushed. That's a good idea. That's a good illustration of a stake with a sheet over it. Um, that sort of thing. Top left is a 
uh, spun the spun fiber over hoops. So you can lots of things you can do. Uh, the vegetable garden, preparing or renovating the beds. Oh, these are my beds, obviously. I do raise beds. So there's two ways to treat the garden soil, by digging or not digging. Personal choice. Those of you who know me, and there's several of you that do, I do not dig. I do not turn. I lasagna garden. So no matter what you choose, even in the fall, some soil amendments are going to be necessary, like manure or compost or bone meal, et cetera. The best way to find out is to be sure to do that soil test and do it early, like do it in September. So when you add those sorts of um, amendments now at the late period, it gives them a good amount of time to start breaking down before you want to plant again. In my garden, like I said, I add in layers. So layer one is manure use, aged and composted. I spread it out evenly across the beds. Best types, believe it or not, bunny. Then if llama and alpaca is good, free range chickens are good, but you need to be sure that that is well composted because the nitrogen on, on fresh will kill your plants. Even um, if you're doing it now though for the winter, you could dig it in good, turn it over um, and then let the soil take care of it. And cow is good as well. So um, you can see this lady here is spreading some of her or, uh, manure. So layer two would be wood ash, a little amount. You don't need a whole lot of wood ash. It can make your um, garden awfully um, alkaline, awfully fast. Cover it with a layer of mulch. This is a good example of that. Um, looks like to me that came right out of the stove. Uh, layer four, leaf mold or aged gray grass clippings. Uh, those are usually free for the raking or free for if you get the kids next door to do it. Um, they'll do anything for a peanut butter brownie for me. That's what they told me anyway. So this is the time to use those aged grass clippings that have sat around semi-composting all summer. And over the winter, they'll break down, making a dense weed prevention mat that's ideal for your no-dig garden. And you can see that they're pretty smooshed down at this point in time. Layer five, freshly fallen deciduous leaves. Like I said, rake up that large pile and top your garden beds with them. This is the time to have the fun. Um, and the kids, if the kids in your neighborhood or the kids in your household are available, they like to jump in them too and then go spread them. So you can spread your leaves as much as four fingers thick. Don't be shy. Wood shavings, like I use, also work well. This little kid looks like he's taking a flying leap into his leaves. So um, this is, just gives you a picture of my garden with um, just the shavings, the wood shavings on them. The bed to the left, the first one on the left, is an established asparagus bed. The one behind it is an established blueberry bed. So the other four I use for vegetables. And the trellises, of course, I grow beans and uh, all sorts of fun stuff on them. So um, starting out, I, this is wonderful. You wanna leave some twigs and leaves and branches. You wanna do some shrub piles. Um, overwintering habitat for pollinators, birds, other small animals like that little weasel that we saw, that little weasel. But if you take a really close look at this picture, I want you to look at the base of the tree um, I cut the branches back to make more room underneath there for my brush pile, but also because to the left, I have a pipe out of my out of my basement that runs constantly. It keeps my it keeps my basement dry and it runs constantly, so it provides water for the birds and other animals. But it wasn't until I stood on my porch to take a picture and looked at the picture on the screen afterwards that I saw the face, see the two eyes and the nose and the mouth. I thought, oh wow, I didn't know it was there. So watching over my house. So we wanna talk a little bit about planting spring flowering bulbs because now's the time to do it. I moved up here 23 years ago with bulbs that I couldn't stop being delivered to my house in Worcester. And no, mid November was on my knees planting bulbs because we just moved here. And my neighbor came across the street and she said, what are you doing? I said, I'm planting bulbs because I just got them. Oh, she says, let me go get my trowel. And she came and helped me plant all my bulbs. So spring flowering bulbs like daffodils, crocuses, tulips, hyacinths, can be planted right now. Every bulb you want to plant has a depth three to four times their maximum bulb diameter. So your crocuses won't be as deep as your tulips. Bulbs themselves don't need the water, but it's a good idea to water the soil first um, as water soil does make it harder for the animals. But if we have in a drought season, which we aren't so much this year, but before we have been, it's also nice to get some water down there so these bulbs can use it right away. Now is the time. It's an excellent month for perennials. Sometimes the perennials become overcrowded. You can divide them out and replant them where they'll have more room. Or you can divide them out and plot them up and take them with you when you're leaving. So this is my front door yard garden. And you can see, and this is midsummer. 
obviously it's not now. Fall is a great time to do this because cooler temperatures give them a growing break. This also tends to be a little bit more rainfall at this time of year. So like they say, plant something. Don't just stand there, plant something. So now early to mid fall is a good time to plant. Cooler temperatures are nice. You wanna get your fall planting done though by the end of this month. So the plants have a chance to establish their root systems. Keep watering, don't forget to water. What we can plant now, garlic and shallots, trees and shrubs, flower bulbs, cool season annuals, mums, asters, lilies go nice now, excuse me. Kale, spinach is good, lettuce, even now you can go spinach and lettuce. So that's um, lettuce. Okay, so transitioning your plants inside for winter. Um, this, these are not my plants, although I do have a Christmas cactus that looks like that. If your house plants have spent the summer outdoors and mine have, now's the time to end their vacation and get them back inside. Like I said, the end of this week, I'm bringing mine back in. When outside temperatures start to be 45 degrees, it's time to bring them in because otherwise they can be chilled. And maybe they don't look chilled. Maybe they look just a little sad, but sometimes you can lose them anyway because if they got too chilled, they went right to the roots. So you want to enjoy them throughout the fall and into the winter months. So prior to the first frost, for sure, you want to bring them in. And when you bring them in, you want to um, keep them at a, in a not a bright sunny spot to begin with, more of a shady spot, and then drag, gradually transition them to their final winter spot. Let's talk about hummingbirds for a bit because I get this question all the time. No, hummingbird feeders do not cause your birds not to migrate. They will migrate. They might fight like crazy over the feeder, but they don't like it enough to risk freezing northern winters. And there's no bugs. There's, they eat bugs. That's their protein source. So our late migrating ruby throats, because that's all we have here, can definitely use extra energy from the feeder as, feeder as they move south. The ones that spent the summer with you are gone already. But if you see them now, and I saw one at my feeder two days ago, he's a, he was a migrant from up above, probably Canada someplace. So these guys will come down and they'll settle down for the night in a nice, lovely evergreen tree. And then in the morning they get up and they're hungry. So seeing that hummingbird feeder still hanging on your porch and it was like seven o'clock in the morning that this guy came right in and I didn't think he was gonna leave. He must've really been hungry. So the, even though the summer residents are gone, there are some others coming through. Now, sometimes we sometimes will get a rare hummingbird that gets blown over here by the storms of fall. So it might not be a ruby throated. So when you see a hummingbird come in, that's a female ruby throated. When you see one come in, take a good look at it. Get out your bird book if it doesn't look like a ruby throated. It could be something from maybe west of the Mississippi where they have like 20 different species. Okay, so now's a great time to think about using other methods. Um, say, talk about lasagna gardening, keyhole gardening. I'm gonna let y'all look that up. That's the most fascinating thing. That's the upper left slide here. Most fascinating thing I've ever seen. I haven't tried it yet though. Companion planting, I do that. Raised bed gardening, that's what I do. And square foot gardening is a lot of fun. And if you've got a small space, think about square foot gardening. Look it up. It's very, very fascinating way to grow things. So you want to make a sketch of your vegetable garden. And it doesn't have to be gorgeous like this. It can be just on a piece of paper and little notes about what grew where last year. You want to know that so that you can rotate next year. Remember, tomatoes and potatoes in the nightshade family should not be grown in the same place year after year. Not only do you wear out the soil, but you leave a virus behind. So you don't want any buildup of diseases in a particular area. Uh, November gardening. Now's the time to evaluate your garden layout. Now that almost everything should be bare by then. So you can really see the bones of your garden. You wanna cover your compost pile. And for me, cover means I throw a tarp over it and then I throw um, a couple of pieces of wood or something like that to hold the tarp down. So the rain does not leach out all the nutrients because if you leave it open and it rains and it snows and it melts, all the nutrients in your compost will just go through it. I uh, dare proof your evergreen shrubs if you need to by encircling them with stakes, attaching burlap to the stakes. The thing here is to keep them away from it, not, not to prevent them from eating it, but it keeps them far enough away. They won't jump over it because there's not enough room. You wanna protect the bark of your younger trees by using one of these wraps that you see on the right and you're protecting it from that wonderful little mouse that's sitting there. Okay, the ground will become frozen some, sometime in December. If you haven't already done it by December, you will need to afford some winter protection to your plants that you think need it. You might not get another chance once we get a deep layer of snow, we don't go anywhere. 
Um, you wanna to continue to inspect your trees and shrubs for bark damage if you didn't do a wrap on it. Bring in any gardening tools that you might still have left outside or missed outside. Sometimes you can see them easier when there's snow. You go, oh my, I forgot, I left that rake over there. Make sure they're clean and rust-free, oiled and properly sharpened. Okay, some last minute tips for outdoors. Label your perennials so you can find them in the spring. And don't everybody laugh, but how many times have you gone out in the spring and said, oh, what's that? And you were sure in the, in the winter, the fall, that you would remember it, yeah. So do it the old fashioned way with a Sharpie and a wooden stake, which is my favorite thing. Take pictures of your beds, draw a bubble map and um, write on the photo and then write in what they are. That's another nice way to do it. Shrubs need shelter too from the snow and the wind. These shrubs are right underneath an overhang from a house. So they definitely need some, um, some protection from the sliding snow. So high winds are not the plant's only enemy. A lot of our deciduous shrubs, um, not like their evergreen friends, provide little visual interest in web winter, but they can really be damaged. Their branches can break and all sorts of stuff like that. So you wanna either build or buy a shelter to house your flowering shrubs. Even my evergreens, if I had evergreens growing underneath a overhang like this, they'd be protected by the same thing. So since most of them don't provide a whole lot of interest in the winter anyway, you have little to lose by making sure they're protected. I love this picture. This is from the, from the um, Netherlands, but this is stakes with burlap wrapped around them to protect the um, plant that's there, whatever that might be, from wind. Pollinators in Maine, I get this question all the time. Where do they go in the winter? So winter for me is snow to early spring. So with snowflakes swirling out the window, Thoughts turn to bees and flies and moths and beetles and butterflies of the spring, summer, and fall. Well, some thoughts do. So where are they now? Those wonderful insect pollinators that we were watching not so very long ago. How do they spend the winter? What do they do? Where do they go? Are they coming back? Will they come back? So the answers are as diverse as the pollinators themselves. Insect pollinators can spend the winter in a variety of life stages, eggs, larva, pupa, or even adults. Some migrate while others hibernate nearby. Now we know that some butterflies migrate, but a lot don't. So some spend their winter in the soil, leaf litter or vegetation, while others can find shelter under bark, logs, stones, or various crevices, which is why I say, pile up your leaves in a corner someplace. Make those um, shrub, um, shrub piles there underneath trees and stuff, because these guys will, these guys will go there. Still others mid overwinter inside tunnels in wood or plant stems or underground. So there's a uh, brush pile and there's just some old logs and they all have crevices and tunnels in them for these insects to go in. I mean, they laid an egg in there and that might be the way it's gonna overwinter that insect. So here's about bees and pollinators. You can use terracotta, which is a middle, middle um, picture there. Pottery pieces of flower pots, hollow bricks, a compost heap the shrub pile, a log pile, straw hay or hollow plant stems. That bottom left picture is corrugated board rolled up. It's sort of like what you might find in a box. You can mix clay and straw. You can take your flower pots, turn them upside down and fill them with hay. But with terracotta, you need to have them in a protected spot. You can't put them out in the middle of your field. They should be in a shed or under um, something like that or in your garage. Native bees and insects. This is my house in winter. And then the bottom two, two pictures are the um, very popular now, you can purchase it sort of thing for native bees, the hollow tubes, for those bees that lay in hollow tubes. Mine are almost filled right now. I was very, very pleased and surprised to see that this year. Um, honeybees, since I am a former beekeeper, I thought I would show you a little bit about honeybees. Um, these are my hives on the left one year down in the field and on the right, one year up a little bit closer to the house, um, a little bit easier for me to get to. But the middle picture is the inside of the hive. So the bottom part of it, where you can see, they have frames and that's where the bees live all, all, all season. So the bottom is the bottom box. And then the top is where the honey is stored in the fall. It's like their pantry. So they start in the bottom. What you see the middle is clustered there is all honeybees. That's a huge, huge hive because it's one, two, three, four, five, six. There's like eight frames of bees there. And that picture would be about March. So that's a really healthy, strong hive, but they've all moved up into the pantry and they do that over the winter. They cluster and in the middle, the queen is there and it's about 92 degrees in the middle of the cluster. 
And then they take turns moving their position to go up and get honey and come back in and switch positions around a little bit. These are the only bees that overwinter as a hive. All the other bees do this. This is like wasps, hornets, and bumblebees. They made a queen um, in the fall. And so the mated queens will um, go find overwintering sites. And that can be under leaf litter. That can be in a mouse tunnel. Um, that can be under, underneath your porch someplace, that sort of thing. But the rest of the hive dies after the second deep frost. So all we've got is hibernating queens out there for wasps, hornets, and bumblebees. You've, I'm sure you've all heard about the tubes for um, the, the, um, the ticks, the lime carrying ticks, uh, putting them into um, white footed mouse tunnels because the white footed mouse is the actual the vector for Lyme disease. Well, think about it. It's called, it's got permethrin in it. Permethrin is an insect killer to kill the ticks. Well, if bumblebees go down there to overwinter or build their hives, because they do like to build hives and tunnels also, what do you think that does to them? Just a thought. So after the spring, the queen hatches out and she goes out and starts new colonies. So in the early spring, when you have this huge buzzy bumblebees flying at your ankle height, those are their queens looking for a place to go. They do like mouse tunnels. They like walls, wooden um, stony walls, that sort of thing. And they start building their colony and they will take care of the whole thing until a certain point. So when they have enough, enough bees in the colony, she'll stay home and the other ones will, fall, will go out. Um, and that's how these guys overwinter. And I thank you very much. And um, I'm, I'm done. So well, well, I don't, I don't thank know what's you. Happening. You're welcome. Thank, thank you for a very interesting talk. And now we'll turn it over to Coralis to ask you questions. Okay? Yeah. That's perfect. Okay. Coralis? <laughs> I'm sorry, I was muted. I'll start again. <laughs> that was not going to help you, was it, Jean? How and, how and when? How and when should we remove violets that are taking over a garden bed? Oh, violets. Ooh, ooh. Mm -hmm. Same thing as Johnny jump ups. Um, yeah, that violets, violets are hard. I just pull them one by one when I see them. I mean, I can't, I can't advocate that you're going to put any poison or anything on them or any, you know, like that. But it's, um, they're tough. tough. Violets are very, very hard. I try to pull them up. Um, actually, I don't pull them. I dig them. I dig them because they actually have quite a root system violets. So they will spread a bit. And you, actually, honestly, you can't always get every single one, but you can do your best with that. But digging and pulling, digging and pulling. And then I throw them someplace where maybe I want them to grow, like in my, um, maybe in my field or maybe um, an unused area of my yard where I want some color. Violets are nice. Violets will also grow in your lawn if you let them. And they make a nice lawn cover to go with your green grass. All right. Um, change of topic. What is the one third rule? I believe that may have to do with pruning. Yeah, it has to do with mowing your lawn. Oh, mowing yeah. your lawn. Well, actually, okay. it does. Actually, it does apply to pruning as well. Come to think of it, but the way I was using it was for the grass. You only want to cut one third, the top one third of your blade whenever you mow. So you don't want to mow an inch and a half or even two and a half inches in the summer. You want to mow three inches, and then you can drop it now to like two inches for the winter. Because if it's too high, it will get a little winter kill or um, there's a pink, oh, they, it will turn pink with the, oh, snow. Snow on a higher grass that makes it fall over will also cause it to call, grow pink and have this virus thing. Um, like I said, I'm not much of a turf person. If it's green, I mow it. But um, that's what the one third rule is. Same thing with pruning though. If you're pruning shrubs, they really do recommend not to prune more than one third of your shrub at a time. So that means if you're pruning in the spring, you want to cut, you know, it's too, it's overgrown. So you're only going to cut one third of your branches. And the next year, you'll do one third more. And you can do, during the spring and summer, you can do little pieces of it, you know, to make it shape better. But you don't want to cut the whole thing down, like half of it all at once, you'll kill it. Okay. Um, a few questions about composting. What about leaving vegetable roots in the soil to decompose and provide compost rather than pulling them out completely? Uh, you could do that. I've not done it, but you could do it. Hmm, that's a thought. That's a thought. Um, the problem, with, the only problem I see with that though, is um, if you're talking about your nightshade crops, you don't want them in the same, you don't want them to stay in the soil. 
because they do they do have you know the verticillin and wilt and other things that'll really make because i just have always pulled them uh, but you can plant a crop a crop that'll do the same thing and then, like a rye and then that that winter kills which is good and you can either if you're a turning in person if you're one that does dig up your soil you can turn that over if you're like me who layers and does lasagna gardening you can um because it's winter killed it acts as a mulch and you can plant right through it so uh, you know your choice i would i would recommend better a cover crop like that that's going to add some nitrogen etc to the soil than leaving the old roots in place because you don't know maybe that plant did have a little bit of a disease thing and you didn't see it so i just i just don't advocate doing it uh, what is the best manure, someone asks? Sheep, horse, chicken, cow? The absolute best is chicken, but you really got to be careful with that. It really does need to compost for a minimum of a year. Um, I like llama poop. Uh, it had, doesn't have a lot of night. It has some nitrogen, but I like it because it's bigger and it's denser. So when you do mix it into your soil, it tends to give it a more open, um, an open feeling. It's not so dense. Remember, we have clay soil here in New England. And boy, does that compact. If you can get it opened with adding amendments like compost and manure. But I do like chicken. Cow would be next for me. Um, but I hear bunny is great, but I've never used it. But I have friends that have bunnies and they swear by it. So um, I don't know. Um, change of topic here. Do I need to wrap my 18 month old maple tree trunk for the winter? I assume she means. So it's not very big around, absolutely. I mean, you can't, it can never hurt to wrap any tree trunk of a young tree. It can never hurt because um, those mice and voles are hungry. And if, it, if the weather gets too bad, they'll eat anything that's available. So if it's a young tree with a not so, uh, an 18 month old tree obviously will not have a huge trunk. So just go to the hardware store and tell them I need, I need the tree wrap stuff. And it's usually, it's plastic now. It used to be paper when I was first starting gardening, it was paper, but now it's plastic. And boy, it wraps up nicely. It really does. And it, it and it's tight enough that it doesn't slide down either. And it's a good protection. I usually wrap it mm, maybe three feet up my tree. Okay, we have one more question. Just and one? Oh. I have a one-year-old perennial garden, huge spread of hyssop that's taking over. Any thoughts about how to divide it? Like anise hyssop? She just said. So maybe she means the general. Regular. Okay, well, it doesn't make any difference, whatever's taking over. Um, so the, the question again was, I've got hyssop and it's taking over. And what was the question? Um, she did add that it was anise hyssop. Okay. Um, it's your old perennial garden with a huge spread of anise hyssop that's taking over. Any thoughts about how to divide it? Yeah, dig it up. I mean, you know, use a shovel and get down. I would start at the edge of your spread put my shovel in and pull up and see how deep the roots are and then decide how much you want to leave and how much you want to dig up and give away. I can't tell you how many beekeepers would kill for anise hyssop. It's good stuff. It's good for all of our, all of our bee type pollinators love anise hyssop. Um, I have quite a bit in my yard. I've already taken my division to take with me to Rhode Island. Um, and I, I think as I, I'm now this is memory. So, and I'm old, so I'm not sure I remember, but wait a second. Um, and everybody who knows me is now laughing. Uh, I think I only went down about one shovel depth and that was right there and I was at the end of the roots. So it's not that big, you know, it's not that hard. Um, I would do it now if you can, just because it's, the soil is still nice. I dug plants the other day and the soil was beautiful. It's nice and friable and it's easy to open up. A couple more questions then about hyssop. Does it need full sun? Yes. Absolutely, mm -hmm. does best in full sun. And uh, and someone else suggested that if you don't dig it now, you might be able to dig it in the spring and donate it to the Belfast Garden Club plant sale. Oh, well, now that would work too. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I'm sorry, I forgot you guys had a had a um, had a, a, a spring sale. I forgot all about that. I I'm not ever come up here for it, but I hear that it's wonderful. I usually because I live in Nobleboro, which is down near Damariscotta. For those of you that might not know, um, I usually do the old Bristol Garden Club one because that's right in literally downtown Damascot or in my backyard. So I go to that one, but I love, I love garden club sales in the spring. And I'm looking forward to finding all my garden clubs in Rhode Island when I get there. Just as, an, very much. Just as an aside, 
my master gardenership comes from the University of Rhode Island. So it's going to be fun to go back down and see if there's anybody left that I remember from 20 something years ago. So uh, thank you all. This has been great fun. I've never done this before, and I think I would do it again. Thank you very much. That's the end of our questions. Okay.